His Excellency President uh, Elbeck Deutsch of Mongolia, Ms. Yuget Labelle, Ms. Elaine Gusinski, members of the Philippine delegation, the WEF and PACHE organizers, honored guests, good evening. The Philippines for the longest time seemed doomed to perform below its potential. This despite abundant natural resources, a strategic location as a gateway between the Pacific and the rest of Asia, and a well-educated and hardworking populace. I think the fact that you invited the Filipino here to speak about an anti-corruption drive speaks of our mutual recognition of the problem and its solution. As I said during my presidential campaign back in 2010, and in, in our language, it said, Kung walang korup, walang mahirap, which means without corruption, there will be no poverty. And while I will be the first to say that the work to uplift the lives of my countrymen is far from over, it is a singular honor to share my experiences in battling corruption and the fruits of our labor thus far. I came into office confronted by a government where corruption was rampant and a citizenry that had, inspired, that had spiraled into apathy after almost a decade of absentee leadership. The system was characterized by transactionalism and an ever, every man for himself attitude, fueled by a drive to remain in power rather than to render true public service. Was it any wonder that an estimated 10 million Filipinos, roughly 10% of our po population, decided to vote with their feet and look for greener pastures abroad? I had to show that change in the fight against corruption yielded positive results for the economy and that these in turn yield benefits not only to those at the top, but the majority of our people. Allow me to share with you a few examples of how we were able to change the face of the Philippines, how we were able to open the Philippines under new management, by going back to the basics of good governance and by casting aside the old ways that were defined not by service but by political expediency. When I came into office, I found that our National Food Authority, the government agency tasked to ensure rice self-sufficiency, had an outstanding debt that from $300 million less than a decade before, when my pre predecessor started in office, had bloated to around $4.4 billion debt. Why? because the previous administration insisted on importing more rice than what was needed to feed our people. So you had a staggering amount of debt and a rice that no one would eat, rotting in warehouses that the government, of course, had to pay rent for. This insanity was justified by convincing our people that we were not capable of feeding ourselves through tilling our own land, hence the necessity of importing rice. We disagreed, and therefore we empowered our farmers we poured funds into irrigation, arterial roads, genuine certified seeds, research into higher yielding crop varieties and other technologies. From importing almost two and a half million metric tons of rice in 2010, now if the weather permits, we are looking at full rice self-sufficiency and even the possibility of exporting it by the end of this year. Another example, our Department of Public Works and Highways for the longest time was known as a hotbed for kickbacks and fund leakages. This has changed by implementing mechanisms for a transparent bidding process, one that encouraged competition amongst contract contractors. The department has saved us at the end of 2012 around $300 million. Take, for example, a tunnel underpass project at the heart of the national capital region. Originally projected to cost around $17 million, it ended up costing about $10.75 million. Not only was it completed on time, but actually a full 100 days ahead of schedule. It was opened in September of last year, and since then an estimated 100,000 commuters each day have been benefiting from faster travel time in our metropolis at significantly lower cost. Here's a final example. In the Philippines, as mandated by our constitution, everyone who works in government submits a sworn statement of assets, liabilities, and net worth. This is basically a public document that shows whether the official accrues wealth in proportion to his earnings as a public servant. If his net worth grows drastically while in office, our laws presume unexplained wealth is ill-gotten. Our Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the primary arbiter and interpreter of our laws, declared less than 2% of his total cash assets in this document. He found it prudent to conceal from the public eye more than 98% of his money. This on top of lingering doubts about his impartiality, given questionable legal decisions, and his deep personal ties with my predecessor, who also happened to be the person who appointed him to office. The Chief Justice is head of a co-equal branch of government, and few would have taken him on 
in a political battle, not on my watch. I made it clear that judicial reform was a pillar of our anti-corruption agenda, and that our Supreme Court justices, being vanguards of what is fair and right, must be beyond reproach. After an impeachment trial that was followed closely by the entire country, our Chief Justice was impeached and removed from office and is currently facing charges. This whole exercise has proven through justice in our country is possible. As you can see, we are changing the attitude of the world towards the Philippines because we are changing the attitude of Filipinos towards the system. Our task to weed out the corrupt, level the playing field, and instill a sense of justice and fairness. When we arrived, we had to deal with the aftermath of an administration whose policies were geared towards remaining in power so that they could game the system to favor themselves and their friends. Decisions were based on politics rather than on sound economic principles. We have now ignited a virtuous cycle where justice breeds the predictability of outcomes, where crimes do not go unpunished, and following the rules has its own rewards. Stability ensues, and stakeholders begin to buy into the system. Investors flock in. Economic gains are channeled into investments in our people's future, such as those in health and education and the citizenry is empowered to spur further growth. You are perhaps familiar with some of the results. The Philippine Stock Exchange Index has, has broken its own record high 70 times, may I repeat that, 70 times since we came into office. We've recorded two consecutive 10 place jumps in the WEF's annual competitiveness rankings index. Our GDP grew by 7.1% in the third quarter of 2012 surpassing most projections, including our own. After getting upgrade after upgrade from credit ratings agencies, we are on the cusp of investment grade status and are in fact, at even at this point, afforded rates equivalent to investment grade in securing our loans. Most concerns I hear now are not about whether change is possible in our country, but whether the kind of momentum we are experiencing can be sustained even after my term ends in 2016. This is a valid concern. After all, in the years after my mother took office and the Marcos dictatorship tumbled a quarter of a decade, sorry, quarter of a century ago, the same healthy amount of optimism in my country existed, only to be derailed by crisis, instability, and self-interest. This is why my administration is now focusing its efforts on institutionalizing reforms. We want change to become an enduring mainstream of progress rather than a mere blip on the radar and a case study for failed expectations. Before the end of 2012, Congress, our Congress, was able to pass a law that could hopefully curb our maternal mortality ratio and promote responsible parenthood and gender equality and equity. We also went up against powerful tobacco and alcohol lobbies in passing a law that earmarks a significant amount of funds for the healthcare sector. And as we speak, the final details of a peace pact with our Muslim brothers in my country's war-torn south is being forged, bringing to sight the prospect of stability and progress in one of the Philippines' most resource abundant yet poorest regions. At the bottom line though, is the process of consensus building through democracy that empowers our citizenry and urges them to buy into the system because they see it, that it works rather because they see that it works. It is the kind of stability that is built by everyone rather than enforced, a harmony achieved through expectations met and not through imposition. We want our people to come to expect more from their government. We want to prove that their mandate given freely during elections counts for something. If the benefits of good governance are palpable, we believe that the old challenge for most Filipinos, one that consists of finding ways to escape the spiral of despair, of finding a different adoptive homeland that will allow them to thrive and will not deprive them of opportunities, we believe that this is transformed into one that asks, what can I do to help? What can I do to ensure that the good things we are seeing now are sustained for the benefit of future generations? Allow me to end with a story. Not too long ago, when I was in Congress, I had the occasion to ask a group of 80 nursing students how many of you would remain in country after completing your studies and passing the board exams? Only two of the 80 raised their hands. Times have indeed changed. Now whenever an overseas worker comes back to the homeland to visit or retrace the roots, the common question asked of them is not anymore, how did you manage to get out? But rather, 
what, when are you coming home for good? To etch positive, meaningful change in stone, to build real foundations to progress, to ensure that Filipinos are able to thrive and succeed within the motherland, that is our challenge. And I believe the Filipino people are up to it and are in fact already showing the world. We are ready, we are dreaming again, and we are on the way to achieving those dreams. Thank you, good evening.